Okay, so uh, we are good to go. All right, Hefa, would you like to uh, kick us off here? Yes, I love when you call me how I deserve. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Veronica Montes. I use she and her pronouns, and I am the director for El Centro. El Centro is our uh, Latinx cultural and community center here at Virginia Tech. And uh, it's a pleasure today to present you to this uh, webinar where we're going to discuss anti blackness and colorism in the Latinx community. Our moderator for today is going to be Dr. Mauro Caraccioli, and I will give that to Mauro right now, and we can start. Thank you for joining. And if you have any question, please use the Q and A uh, option here at the webinar. All right, wonderful. And I'm I'm hoping folks um, can hear me just fine. I, I imagine the panelists, you all can hear me. Okay, great. So. Um, Let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and buenas tardes. So uh, my name is Mauro Jose Caraccioli. I'm an assistant professor of political science at uh, Virginia Tech uh, here in Blacksburg, Virginia. And I'm delighted to serve as the moderator for tonight's event, which is actually uh, the first installment in a series of symposia and lectures for uh, National Hispanic uh, Latinx Heritage Month, uh, a series of symposia and lectures that are focusing on myths and misconceptions within and about the Latinx community. Tonight's event is a scholarly roundtable on the subject of anti-blackness and colorism in the Latinx community with the subtitle of Myths of a Rainbow Coalition. Against popular depictions of Latinos as multi monolithic and one-dimensional groups, our panelists tonight will actually be drawing attention to different tensions, collaborations, and transformations within Latinx communities in the fight against racism and colorism. Whether it be the paradox between so-called white Hispanic support for the Trump administration and the growing prominence of white supremacist views in the US, or recent revelations about celebrities and scholars even using Latinx and Afro-Latino identities to benefit monetarily and professionally, the question of who gets to accurately represent the perspectives of Latinx Afro-Latino voices remains a charged and controversial topic in our communities. Our participants will address various aspects of these tensions and raise important questions about what Latinx people, particularly those of us who are lighter skinned and often benefit from the structures of white supremacy, what we can do to challenge and transform the biases within our different communities. I'm thrilled tonight to present to you three special guests who I will say a few brief words about, but I'll also invite them that uh, in the context of their insights and their experiences with us to say anything that I may, um, uh, I may lie that I may not fully uh, provide in terms of information. Uh, our program tonight will begin with Dr. Brian Lovato, who is an assistant professor of politics, administration and justice at California State University Fullerton. Dr. Lovato's research focuses on critical theory and black political thought. He is the author of the book, Democracy, Dialectics, and Difference, and is also an editor for Abolition, a journal of insurgent politics. He currently resides with his family on the traditional and unceded homeland of the Tongva people, and his remarks tonight will be entitled Junior Partners in White Supremacy, Why Anti-Blackness is a Problem for the Latinx Community. Following Brian is our very own Dr. Leticia Ingracia Cardoso Brown, who is assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Virginia Tech, her research focuses on topics such as race and racism, black feminisms, sports, food studies, black girlhoods, and culture. Dr. Cardoso Brown's work can be found in other outlets such as the Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, the South African Review of Sociology, the Palgrave Handbook of Feminism and Sport, Leisure and Physical Education, as well as the Shadow League. And her comments tonight are titled, If You're Black, Get Back, a conversation on anti-blackness and colorism. And lastly, we're joined tonight by Dr. Sebastian Sklovsky, Assistant Professor of Criminal Justice at California State University Stanislaus. Born and raised in Uruguay, Dr. Sklovsky holds a PhD in political science from the University of Florida. His research focuses on police violence and racism and he's currently working on a book manuscript on the effects of police violence among residents of South Los Angeles and Sao Paulo's favelas and how their experience with police violence shapes their racial and spatial identities. His presentation tonight is titled The Limits of Representation or The Dangers of Authenticity. 
So for tonight's program, we're going to go in the order of introductions with each participant speaking for about 10 to 15 minutes, leaving ample time for conversation and participation uh, from the audience and, of course, among us as panelists. Uh, the order of the presentations are going to be Dr. Lovato, uh, Dr. Cardoza Brown, and Dr. Sklovsky. So um, I will uh, mute my mic and, and I'll turn it over to um, Brian, who uh, will share his screen with us here. All right. Thank you so much. Let me make sure I'm getting this set up correctly. Um, okay, so that should be full screen for everyone. Um, okay, so first off, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this. Um, it's, a, it's a big honor uh, to be part of this, uh, to be included. And um, yeah, so my, my current research focuses on the concept of anti-blackness and the possibility of solidarity, uh, particularly with non-Black people of color. Uh, so when I was invited to be on this panel, I was really excited and I thought, okay, I can kind of work out some preliminary thoughts on this issue. And so I, I titled this piece, uh, Junior Partners and White Supremacy, which is uh, taking a cue from the work of Frank Wilderson, this idea of junior partners. And in this presentation, I wanna move through three ideas somewhat briefly, hopefully opening up uh, some ground for discussion and hopefully it connects with some of the other conversations we're having as well. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about is gonna be um, the uh, role of Latinx voters in uh, the election of Donald Trump. Um, move from there to the relationship of that role uh, to um, the racial order in the United States. And then finally uh, to the idea of anti-blackness as a grounding for the modern political world um, and hopefully then move into some questions um, about where we go from there. So here's a picture of that guy and uh, we can see in the background right several people holding signs that say Latinos for Trump and it's probably troubling to a lot of you um, Right, maybe you know some Latinos for Trump. Um, maybe they're your family members, right? Um, my parents voted for Trump, which is a very bizarre phenomenon. And I'm trying to grasp why someone would do this, right? But, but they're not alone, right? Nearly 30% of Latinx voters cast their vote for Donald Trump, the candidate known for his racism, misogyny, and xenophobia. And I think this, this raises a lot of questions for us, right? First off, this does seem to actually match up with Latinx views on issues of race and immigration. Um, and I've got links to some um, information from Pew if anyone's interested in, in looking into that at all. But there does seem to be um, a match between views on uh, the benefits of immigration um, openness of borders, paths to citizenship, as well as um, racial discrimination and, um, and the history of racism in the U.S. Um, there, it seems to match up with this percentage that voted for Trump. So it, it's not surprising necessarily that we ended up with nearly 30% of Latinx voters voting for Trump. But the question is, well, what's behind this? What's, what's going on here? Right. And Jasmine Haywood in her 2017 article argues that really this is grounded in anti-black racism, which is, is probably a bold claim because those of us who know family members who voted for Trump probably would say, oh, I don't have a racist bone in my body or something like that. But Haywood makes a, a compelling argument uh, when she relates it to um, policy and culture in Latin America that uh, finds uh, outlets also in, in U.S. Latinx culture, right? In particular, the phenomenon of uh, blanqueamiento, uh, whitening, right? And mestizaje, uh, mixing, right? And that she says these are, these are examples of the pervasive colorism we see in Latin America, right? One of them with a goal of ultimately ending up at whiteness, one at a, with not necessarily a goal of ending up at whiteness, but of, but of producing a, a mixed um, national identity, right? But, but for Haywood and for other scholars, these ideas are grounded in, in anti-blackness and also anti-indigeneity, right? You can mix away the native, you can mix away the black, whiten, right? 
And I'll, I'm going to move to a painting in just a minute that, that shows that um, in action, right? But, but Haywood also notes that it's important to pay attention to two factors, right? First off, the differences within groups, right? To speak of the Latinx vote is, is to speak of a very, um, very uh, varied <laughs> uh, voting block with a lot of difference loaded into it, right? So she said we need to pay attention to class, to race, right? That, that Latinx, Latinx is not a race, right? It's a, a pan-ethnic category. And so we need to pay attention to race, right? This is not gonna be showing up amongst um, Afro-Latinx people. Um, gender, right? It turns out that far more men voted for Trump. So misogyny is also playing a role in there, but also national origin, right? Cuban-Americans voted for Trump at something like three times the rate of, of other Latinx voters. So there's a lot of dynamics going on in there and we can't simply say, oh yes, the Latinx vote is grounded in anti-Blackness, or this 30% is, right? We need to really take apart what's going on there. And she also says the other factor to pay attention to is internal oppression and double consciousness, right? That, that colonization does a number on people, and, and we can't take that for granted. We can't assume um, anything about authentic interests or uh, positions, and that, that there's a lot of, of psychological work being done, psychological and, and um, like a social psychological cultural work being done um, with anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity um, through um, colonization, particularly um, settler colonialism as it exists in the Americas. And so, uh, right, and I think this talk of authenticity is gonna show up in one of the later talks, so this is good. Um, here we, we have a, a, a picture, a painting uh, from Modesto Brocas, um, and it, he's, a, he's a, a Spaniard who came to Brazil and lived his life there, but he, it's entitled The Redemption of Ham, right? If, if you're aware of, of the biblical story of, of Noah's children, supposedly Ham has black skin as a curse, um, and this, uh, this narrative lingers on through the US and in Latin America. Um, but, but here we see the redemption of Ham through a whitening policy in Brazil, right? That there was an active official policy of whitening. We see a black grandmother, um, a half black daughter, a, um, a white father producing, um, to, to use the, the, the terms uh, that were being used at the time, or a quadroon child, but it's, it's a process of whitening over three generations. And this was the official policy in Brazil, right? So Haywood notes that these policies don't just disappear, right, or the ideas behind the policies don't just disappear when we um, no longer have them um, as official status. It was also a policy in Cuba, right? There was a, this movement to, to bring in European immigrants in order to maintain a stronghold of white supremacy in Cuba. Um, and we still see kind of cultural whitening. For example, uh, Latinx people marking white as their racial response that's increased in recent years on this census. So I wanna move from, from this idea of anti-blackness among um, of Latinx voters to the idea of the US racial order, right? That typically, historically, we've discussed it as um, white versus non-white, right? That that's, that's the, the color line in the US. Um, more recently, Eduardo Bonilla Silva has suggested that we're actually moving toward the much more common um, Latin American um, description of a tri-racial system. And he says this is due partly to demographic shifts, right? the fact that, um, that um, Latinx people actually outnumber uh, African Americans as a minority at this point, um, as well as other historical political factors. And so we can see kind of this traditional understanding on one side of white versus non-white, right, this color line, this is from um, Joel Olson's piece, uh, Whiteness and the 99%, right, he shows also this class line running through here, that there is access to, to capital for non-white people, but it's very limited. Um, and also, right, that, that we've all heard the stories of how the Irish became white or how Italians became white, right, that there is movement across this, but that, it, it's, so it's a semi-permeable line, but that's defining U.S. race relations, right? Bonilla Silva's argument is that we're moving towards uh, this 
tripartite um, categorization where we have um, so-called whites, honorary whites, and then the collective black. And you can look at this chart, who falls into these categories, right? You might take issue with some of uh, the positionings we see here. Um, but we can see, right, that there's a lot more movement and that, that being an honorary white also comes with, with a bundle of privileges, right? The so-called wages of whiteness, access to some of those occur. Um, whereas there are some people who seem bound forever in this collective black category. And so I want to pose the question of what the implications of a tri-racial as opposed to biracial order might be. And I think we can see that as we saw in Latin America, you have an incentiviz incentivization of whitening and mixing in order to move up this hierarchy, in order to purchase cultural capital, have access to these wages of whiteness. You also might see a cultural distancing of oneself or one's group from the lower positions on the hierarchy, right? That, oh, those aren't really us or they're not like us. And we see this with the erasure of indigenous people and indigenous identity um, and of, of Afro-Latinx people, right? That they're somehow not authentically Latinx or not like us, right? Which then also allows for this wondrous uh, magical move when you might hear uh, folks from Latin America say, oh, well, we don't have race problems here. We've overcome that. But I think also what we see is a persistent anti-Blackness, right? That this third category of the collective Black, right, you can't move out of there. You can move out of there through, I guess, through multi-generational whitening projects, right? You can move out of there through assimilation in some ways, but but there's a persistent anti-blackness that occurs here. And I think paying attention to anti-blackness is, is crucial here. And one way we can get there actually is instead of looking at this uh, whites versus non-whites that we see in the biracial category, I think if we turn towards um, scholars of anti-blackness, particularly Afro-pessimist scholars, who I think are not 100% correct in all of their assessments and analysis, offer us some um, helpful insights into what's going on. And so Frank Wilderson, Jared Sexton, others um, have, have argued right, that anti-Blackness actually serves as the grounding for modern political life, that we couldn't have the modern world without anti-Blackness. And Wilderson describes this relationship as, as parasitic. Right? And he constantly refers to this divide, this racial color line, as Black and non-Black. And he says it's parasitic because white and non-black subjectivity cannot be imbued with the capacity for self-knowledge and inner subjective community without anti-black violence, without that is the violence of social death. In other words, white people and their junior partners need anti-black violence to know they're alive. We might say, well, this is far too bold of a claim. What does this mean to know they're alive? But I think, this move that Wilderson makes is very helpful for understanding this, right? That anti-Black violence is in fact the grounding of the modern world. Um, I believe Jared Sexton says that slavery is the threshold to the political world, right? That we can't get to where we are without this. So who are these junior partners, right? These, these non-Black people that Wilderson talks about? Well, this part right here, I think, is not all that controversial, right? That civil society is modeled on the white heterosexual man as the ideal political actor, right? We see that in Carol Caitman's The Sexual Contract, uh, Charles Mills' The Racial Contract. Um, and then Wilderson, starting in 2002, we can see him talking about these junior partners. And so they're, they're outside of this, um, this ideal category of the white heterosexual man, but they're not into this other realm of blackness. And where Wilderson is, is unique and where the Afro-pessimists are unique is that it's not necessarily a hierarchy of a, a top-down, but it's an inside-out, right? That you are either human or you are black for, for the Afro-pessimists, right? So that it's, it's, it's a much harsher dividing line. And in, in 2002, Wilderson says, you know, uh, indigenous peoples actually um, can't be junior partners. 
um, because um, the modern world's also grounded in genocide and colonialism. But by 2020, he's starting to say, well, no, they, they can be junior partners because if they got their land back, then, then they could uh, function in civil society. I, I don't necessarily buy that argument. I think, right, if, if we're giving indigenous people the land back, the modern political world's gonna look very different. So here we have a picture of another awful human being, right, George Zimmerman. Who, who kills Trayvon Martin in cold blood. Um, and he was often identified as a white Hispanic in the news, right? And he tried to say, well, I can't be racist, I'm Hispanic. But we can see Zimmerman as an example of this junior partner in the most extreme sense, right? That he's actually acting out racialized violence. We can see it in outright racist attitudes, right? But we can also see it perhaps simply in voting for policies that maintain the structure of anti-blackness, right? And sometimes these policies might even appear progressive, but, but maintain this grounding. And I, I have some questions I wanted to get to, but I know I'm out of time. So I wanna move on um, and, and allow time for the other panelists and some discussion. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Brian. Okay, next uh, we turn to uh, Dr. Letitia and Gracia Cardoso Brown. Yep. Thank you. So, good, good evening. My talk today is titled If You're Black, Get Back a Conversation on Anti Blackness and Colorism. I'm kind of going to focus on on representations of Afro-Latinx people and ideas and understandings of what colorism is and what anti-Blackness means and how these coalesce in our society and translate to larger social issues. So thank you for the previous conversation that we had. I think it's really interesting, the conversation, how it was going towards the end made me really think about Joe Fagan and this notion of sincere fiction. So I can't be racist because I have black friends, but I voted for Trump. So you do these racist actions, but you believe sincerely that you're not racist because you do what you consider to be non-racist things. So, colorism is a notion that exists within all communities of color in which there's a privileging of those that are fair over those that are not. And as you can see in this photograph, we have lots of lightning creams that are based on African formulas or titled African formulas that exist globally. And so this is related to the notion of skin color stratification, which is a society that bases resources on skin tone. And it exists globally and within Latinx communities. And it's similar to this notion of a pigmentocracy, which is status-based and closely tied to notions of a caste system which also then of course brings us to the notion of a beauty cue in which particularly among women, there is this leveling and line from lightest to darkest in terms of what is considered beautiful and who gets to be beautiful and enact in erotic capital, meaning attractiveness and um, sensuality. And so thinking about tropes um, among African-Americans, for instance, in the US, the concept of the Jezebel was often depicted as a lighter skinned black woman who was sexually desirable. And these types of tropes exist in other ideas and we have notions of like the saucy Latina. And so there are these controlling images of women of color that permeate mainstream thought and the media. So then why does colorism matter? We can clearly see that there are people within certain races that are different shades, but does it really impact our lives? And it does. It is a key measure for assessing social, cultural, and economic ramifications when we live in a racialized society, which we do here in the US and in Latin America and globally. Um, I've done some work on weight inequality in education in Brazil and Education in Brazil is very stratified across skin tone and racial categorization. And in this article, Skin in the Game, um, 
Doctors Foy and Ray discuss the ways in which black male athletes are discussed differently in the league based on skin color, because colorism permeates all levels of our society. So then what is anti-blackness? Um, we heard in the previous talk notions of Afro-pessimism and thinking about blackness as being beyond living. So you're alive or you're black. And for people like Sadia Hartman, it is this racial calculus and political arithmetic that we've entered centuries ago. And it is based upon this afterlife of slavery, which skews our life chances in terms of health, education, incarceration, and impoverishment. And it's tied to this notion that the black is always other and to be black is to be a slave or enslaved or to have the capacity to be enslaved by innate nature. So too, it is, according to Dr. Myra Washington, the multiple institutions working together to marginalize blackness. So thinking about the healthcare system and education and the criminal justice system in particular, and why anti-Blackness matters within Latinx communities and within communities of color is that it wants us to distance ourselves from Blackness because to be Black is to be dead, essentially. And nobody that is alive, mostly, doesn't want to be dead. And so you want to put space and distance between this. But then there are also questions of like how this is perpetuated and one of the major social institutions that controls our understandings and shapes our experiences of anti-Blackness is the media. So through the media, we see these images that promote racial inferiority, which contributes to a lack of empathy for Black life. And due to this lack of empathy, we become desensitized to Black suffering as a society and to the idea of Black humanity. And this comes about, this decentralization is through the brutal violence and death of Black people that we see continuously. There are videos on the news, on social media. You can't click Facebook, Twitter, Instagram without seeing Black death. And so we see it in real time, which makes this incredibly, incredibly hard to dislodge from our minds. And so we become desensitized to Black death, and we become to associate Blackness with death. And so anti-Black racism functions to keep Black people and Black identified people as marginalized within our society. And one of the ways that this plays out in the media within the Latinx community is by the erasure of Afro-Latinas. So we have some sitcoms, not many, though we're getting more in terms of representation of Latinx families within the media and within television and film. But one of the issues is that when Latinx people are represented, it's through stereotypical roles and the casting continues to portray a very singular look. And this look doesn't typically include Afro-Latinas or Afro-Latinx people. And it means that the women are often more overly sexualized and the men have to be dominant and macho and exude machismo because that is the stereotypes that we have in our head through media representations within the Latinx community and that we see constantly on our television screens. So then this raises questions of who gets to be Latinx? Who can claim the identity, the culture, and what does it mean to be Afro-Latinx within the media? And so here we have Zoe Zeldana, who identifies as, you know, whose heritage and background includes Dominican and Puerto Rican and Black. And so but when people would discuss Zoe Zeldana earlier in the news, it would just as a Black woman and kind of like this erasure of her Latinx identity. But then this too correlates to the notion of colorism. Beside her, you will see a photograph of Nina Simone. 
I'm not sure how many of you are aware that Zoe played Nina Simone in a biopic in which she darkened her skin and wore a prosthetic nose. And so who gets to play what in our society? Which actresses get what roles? And thinking recently, like, was it last night, the Emmys? Yes, in which um, Zendaya won an Emmy and became the second Black woman to do so for a lead in a drama role and the youngest to do so. And thinking about her role on the show Euphoria, parallel to Viola Davis, who was the other Emmy holder, whose role as Annalise Keating, and thinking about the portrayals that we have of light and dark-skinned women within the media and kind of like the erasure of Zoe's Latinx identity through her the choices and the roles that she's played aside from Colombiana and thinking about how lighter skin individuals tend to be able to have more cachet, not only within Hollywood, but within society in general. But recently, um, no, that's not the right one. Even though um, we saw this biopic, she came out recently, like last month to apologize for playing Nina Simone and saying that she knows that she should have used her leverage to have a different actress portray the role because she knows that Nina Simone's entire fight was against issues of colorism. And so thinking about that and thinking about the ways in which identities are erased within the media and within film and who gets to be Latinx and who gets to be Afro-Latinx. So, there was a recent article called My Skin is Black, My Name is Latino that should not surprise you. But it does surprise people. People are often surprised when they run into people that are phenotypically Black and at the same time speak Spanish or don't or <laughs> have roots in Latinx communities. But Jose Wilson says that his blackness was never in question. His skin, his lips, his hair would never allow it. But on the other hand, the idea of embracing his Latinx identity has always been called into question. And so once again, we are asking and we are reminded about who gets to embrace these identities and hold on to these identities as being both black and Latinx and how do we as a society come to terms with the fact that the Latinx community is not monolithic and that it includes a legacy that's tied to the transatlantic slave trade, that's tied to the Underground Railroad and these experiences of being Black in Latinx communities and in the US. So to end, because I want to leave ample time for questions, I would say that my concluding thoughts are, it is important to recognize and understand the differences between ethnic identity and racial identity, as well as national origin, because I think that we often conflate those things within US society and within societies at large, is that we forget that national, national identity does not necessarily translate to racial identity. Thank you. Oh, and these are some references. Thank you so much, uh, Letitia. And um, just as a point of reference, um, if uh, Letitia or Ryan, you have slides you'd like to share um, once we hit the, the Q&A portion, please keep those handy because we'll have a chance um, to do so. Uh, so fi our final um, uh, presentation for the evening uh, is Dr. Sebastian Sklowski. Hi everybody, um, thank you for very much for the invitation. I'm really honored to, to be part of this and be part of this conversation. Um, so I wanna start with, with what I thought was gonna be the last part of my presentation, uh, which was one question to throw there. So I'm gonna start by that question. And what I wanted to ask, and I, and I really don't have an answer or I don't have a clear answer, um, is can we have a Latino political project? Um, and by political project, I don't mean, you know, that Latinos will vote for this candidate or the other, but actually um, a project, a political project that we call, can call, you know, embracing or, or an umbrella political project that address Latinos issues. Um, and my first answer is no, and I'll, I'll try to explain. And, you know, it's not a conclusive no, but it's a partial no. Um, and I'll explain in a moment why. 
And the other question that I wanted to throw out is, can we have a, um, can we have a Latino project that addresses anti-blackness? And I am really a little bit more optimistic there, and basically based on uh, my research and the research of many other people who have done, especially in LA. Um, and one of the things that we see historically in LA is that actually Latinos and black people have uh, sometimes come together, and they come together basically due to police violence. Um, these communities have suffered police violence in South LA basically because black people in particular and in general, but also Latinos in many ways, they threaten or they pose a threat to the Anglo white order of LA, this uh, image of, you know, Los Angeles as an Anglo white order, uh, Anglo white city, um, but also, you know, they pose a threat to the US essence as a white nation, US identity as Brazil's identity and many other countries, but especially Brazil and, and, and the US. They have been built around this idea of whiteness, and they have a, a, an essential white identity, um, which, as my colleagues have, have powerfully shown, black people are central to that because that white identity is constructed in opposition to blackness. Um, so blacks are very are central to it, but at the same time they are external and they are a threat, and they need to be controlled, surveilled, and you know, and suffer. Uh, you know, they're vulnerable to premature death, death in the words of. Uh, um, Ruth Gilmore Wilson, um, but police violence has brought these communities together, so there is some chance here and there to do that. So the, th there, the three elements that I want to uh, share, or three thoughts that I want to share, and, and I start by, by saying why I think that it's complicated to have, you know, a Latino political project, as some, you know, politicians and also some scholars think, you know, that we can have that umbrella category and create a project. Um, and I'm not sure because there are many topics, including police violence and including, you know, and, and the example of LA here comes from the other side, in which those affected inside the community, and, and we can say the same by black people, but in a, in a lower sense, okay, um, they experience those state violence and that vulnerability, vulnerability to death in very different ways, okay, and sometimes in antagonistic ways, right? Um, so there are a couple of things that I do want to, you know, throw there to just for the conversation. And, and, and I divide it into three aspects. So the first one is class matters, right? Uh, not only class, of course, you know, race we've been talking, and that's central, but I think that in that category, we need to incorporate class as we need to incorporate gender uh, into that category and so on, and they're very important, right? The experience of, you know, there's a lot of talk about Latinos, but the experience of Latinos is transversed by race, uh, it's transversed by gender, and it's transversed by class, right? Um, and sometimes those class elements create part of the antagonism or the anti-black antagonism. And I'll give the example of where I live. I live in the Central Valley here in California, uh, one of the main places of mass incarceration. Okay? If you look at California, um, this rural area, you know, it has around 17% of Californians live in the Central Valley, but a little bit less than half of the prisons in California are in the Central Valley. And, you know, as, as political scientists sometimes talk about, you know, institutions const construct their constituencies. And for many people, especially for many Latinos, low, -cum, low, -income, uh, um, low income Latinos, mass incarceration has become one of the main sources of income. Uh, and they create that constituency. They are not ideologically committed to mass incarceration, but they need to buy food and they need to buy health and they need to, you know, have a living and so on. And that creates a constituency that ends supporting many of the politics and the policies of mass incarceration, which are easy to sustain because of the anti-blackness, because the main victims of this program and this process are black people, right? Um, and I'm not saying that white people are not affected, you know, the majority of people in, in prisons are low-income whites, but disproportionately black people are affected by mass incarceration. That allows, that makes it much easier to create that constituency to support that. But just in an anecdotal evidence is like one student of mine once told me, you know, I have, I have two possibilities for like in career options. I'm going to be in prison. The question is if I'm, which side of the fence I'm going to be, you know? Uh, and that's not something, you know, that's not a, a theoretical thought. That's a very kind of practical thought. And joking, you know, with her in a very way, real way, she said, well, you know, at the end of the day, it's the, there's a chance that I may be guarding my cousins who are going to be on the other side. And that's a reality. And that's a reality very much shaped by, you know, the, the economic
economic structure, uh, like, you know, as, as um, Ruth uh, Gilmer, uh, Wilson Gilmore powerfully explains, much of the prison boom has, you know, very strong uh, roots in the economic changes and the economic policies and the crisis of the 70s and so on. It has very little to do with crime because actually the prison boom came when crime was going down, not when crime was going up. Uh, um, so she says, you know, crime went up, we cracked crime and we built prisons. Um, but that creates, so, so much of the Latino experience is we need to, you know, start to disentangle and deconstruct the idea of Latinos. And I think that class matters and also gender, you know, uh, um, regarding, you know, black women, uh, Patricia Hill Collins powerfully explains how you know, uh, much, some of the feminist movement, especially white middle-class feminist movement, was supported by black domestic workers, right? By the exploitation of black work. You know, the fact that I can go and advance my career as a white middle-class woman was based on the back of black women working at my home and taking care of my kids and so on. And that's very powerful in Latin America, even more powerful than in, uh, in the US. So gender also contributes a lot to those terms. And it happens also in the black community, um, but here also it happens in the, uh, in the Latino community. So that's one aspect that I think it's interesting to think about because the experience of Latinos, when we talk about the Latino experience, uh, it, it, there, there are many Latinos experiences. There's not one. And gender defines that. Race, it has been powerfully arg argumented, so I'm not going to go back into that. Uh, uh, both Brian and Latisha already really uh, uh, explain that, um, but gender and class really defines that, and we need to consider that if we're going to talk about uh, you know, creating a political project, what that political project should look, should look like, what it uh, can have, and so on, and especially we're looking at creating coalitions with black people and fighting anti-blackness. So we need to consider gender, we need to consider class in those equations. The other thing that disturbs me a little bit, not from the talk, on the contrary, the talk inspired my disturbances. Um, but the story in general with the conversation of Latinos and the Latinos experience and so on is that we sometimes, uh, especially in academia, but not only, um, there's a lack of historicization of, I, I, you know, I don't know if the term is correct, but there's a lack of historicization of the Latino experience. There's this sense, and I had this argument with, with this conversation with, with uh, um, this new project that is coming out to create a Latino criminology and so on, which I think is very much welcome. Um, but this idea that the Latino experiences or Latino history begins when they cross the border is that everything that it's outside of the U.S. it's prehistorical, and history starts when we are in the U.S. And you know it's very imperialistic, very colonialistic. We can understand why, but I think it's very problematic because the Latino experience doesn't start when Latinos cross the border, um, and it starts way before. And I think that part of the problem when we don't historicize is that we don't understand the uh, difference, the, again, the difference, different experiences, um, but also it reinforces this idea that Latino here came, you know, in the search for the American dream and came in the search of the land of freedom and so on. And this connects the fact that my, one of the biggest forces that pushes that immigration is actually U.S. imperialism. Um, so I rather question this idea of, you know, the Latino, the, uh, sorry, the American dream, the search for the American dream and the sacrifices for, you know, to get to the land of freedom and so on, because I imagine that many people would have preferred to stay at home or to stay in their birthplace and not having to move out. Uh, although I do believe that people should have the right to move wherever they want and live wherever they want. And, you know, borders shouldn't be an issue anymore, but we are still in that crazy world. And I think that the classic example of the problem that I'm facing here, or the problem that, that I see is Hamilton, the Broadway play, which actually has, it's really nice, has a wonderful musical, uh, but the moment it's trans, it, it, it transformed into, na, into an educational and, and message way or a, or, or a pseudo radical uh, projection of whatever they want, that's when I start to have problems with it, okay? I don't have problems with the music, I don't have problems with the acting, you know, very nice show. The problem with it then, you know, it becomes an issue of representation or whatever, right? And I think that Hamilton is the classic example of the limits of representation. So here we have Lin-Manuel Miranda, an elite Puerto Rican, from an elite political family from Puerto Rico, 
a family that has been central to the establishment of the Fiscal Commission in Puerto Rico, okay, that has continued the colonial oppression in Puerto Rico, becoming the hero of radicalism and becoming the hero of you know, a revolutionary stand and so on. Hamilton is an idealization of the founding fathers, is an idealization of the American dream. Hamilton, it's not an, he's not an immigrant, at least in the sense that we understand immigrants today, or at least in the sense that we understand Latino immigra immigration, you know, the popular conception of Latino immigration today. It's not a story of an immigrant that overcame huge struggles and so on, and suddenly realized that he didn't like slavery, although he benefited widely from slavery and so on, okay? And the fact that black people are on stage uh, acting as founding fathers, I found that not very revolutionary. I found that interesting. Uh, but revolutionary, I have my doubts, okay? And the key here of the problems of representation came when a lot of Puerto Ricans, especially black Puerto Ricans, came after Lee Manuel Miranda in social media. And they went after him harshly because of his role, uh, because of the, 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 the whole problem that, that happened when he brought Hamilton to the island, uh, but also, you know, uh, his role in, in promoting the fiscal commission, uh, uh, you know, that, that brought more austerity to the colony, and so on and so on. So black Puerto Ricans in particular were criticizing him harshly because of, you know, not portraying Hamilton as, as, as a slavery promotion or, or a lot of other things there and so on. And one of the people that came out to defend uh, Lima Miranda was Ava DuVernay, which I really like loved her documentaries. And I was uh, quite surprised by, by her strong defense. And I think that her defense is quite solid and strong uh, because part of her defense is, she said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but she said something along the lines, I'm tired of having people um, asking, I'm tired of having people asking people of color to educate you. Go and educate yourself. Well, is Manuel Miranda people of color? Let's say it is. But here we have black Puerto Ricans that are complaining about their colonial situation. And here we have, you know, and, and, and that's part of the, you know, issue of, of what happens. And I think that uh, we need to historicize the, the Latino experience in order to address imperialism, to address colorism, to address anti-blackness, and so on. The thing comes, you know, in social science, things are much worse, right? Uh, and, and just as an anecdote, I remember in the 2016 election, um, seeing one, you know, one of these uh, guru of polling saying that, first of all, saying that Hillary was going to win by a landslide margin, then when things started to get complicated, he argued, you know, in Twitter that, uh, don't worry, there's a surge in the Latino vote in Florida, so there's a chance that Hillary is going to take Florida, and part of it because there was a surge in the uh, Latino vote in the, port, in the um, Orlando corridor. And again, you know, anybody who knows a little bit of the, of the Orlando corridor knows, knows that many of the Puerto Ricans there are not going to vote for Hillary, they were going to go and vote for Trump, okay? Uh, uh, not all of them, and so on. But the problem is that, you know, we have this umbrella category of Latinos without any type of historization, without any type of addressing, you know, colorism, without any type of addressing class. And we think that, you know, that we are all the same and we are, you know, the same. So the last point that I want to make uh, in order to start thinking, okay, what type of project we can bring from this, what type of political project we can bring from this, is the problem that I have with the industry of authenticity and the Jessica Kruger's case, okay? Now, I don't want to go, I'm not going to go into the Jessica Kruger's case, okay, you can look at it, you can get into the conclusions and so on, but I'm going to, just something that Touré Reed said that I find it very interesting. And I'm not like, again, I'm paraphrasing, but it's more or less along the lines that he said, the problem is not of cultural appropriation, but the liberal trend to legitimize voices based on claims of authenticity, in particular in academia, but also in politics. So the problem here is that authenticity has become this racist stereotype, based on these racist stereotypes, okay, in which we give to someone, because it represents our racist stereotypes, the authority to speak on behalf of a whole community. And that happens for Latinos, but that happens also for black people and so on. So it portrays Latino and black experience in a very racialized and stereotypical way. It shows that the experiences are monolithic, you know, it tends to benefit generally liberal, uh, middle, upper class ideology, okay? Um, and, you know, um, and it thinks that because having, you know, some black person or Latino person in power is enough to address 
the problems uh, um, that we have. So the problem of authenticity, according to Reed, it's not actually Jessica Kruger, but those who are paying for that element to grow. And why they're paying? Because it doesn't present any type of political challenge. So in many ways, Jessica Kruger, with huge distances, it represents Hamilton. It's connected with Hamilton. Hamilton is very nice and it's very welcome because it doesn't represent any type of political challenge to the structures of the US as a white nation, okay, nor uh, that, you know, to the Latino community. Thank you very much. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, if you're joining us at home, uh, please uh, let's give a virtual round of applause to our excellent um, panelists. And um, the Q&A uh, room or uh, option is open, so we encourage, um, we encourage uh, audience members to please uh, take a moment uh, to, uh, to send some questions for our panelists. And um, as folks are doing that, I also encourage the panelists, if you have questions or points of clarification um, to make from the previous presentations, um, feel free to think of something there um, and weigh in as well. I have a couple, but I know that um, it takes a little bit longer to articulate questions um, uh, via the chat function. So I'm just gonna uh, wait to 10 before I throw a question. Okay, we're still waiting, but um, how about we get uh, the, the conversation going? And um, I wanted to ask Letitia a, a question. Um, one of the um, uh, Ill images that you, you pointed in your presentation, um, which you know, for, for, uh, became sort of evident uh, for those of us who watched all, all seasons of, of the show avidly, uh, waiting for some kind of twist, but in good telenovela fashion, uh, you know, Jane the Virgin ended um, much in the same way that um, a certain kind of genre of Latino uh, telenovela ended, right? It ended sort of on this high note, despite kind of all of these tragedies that happen um, along the way, uh, including, as, 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 you, as many of you may know who've watched the show, um, the death of one of its Black actors, right? And, and kind of the way it's in which sort of presented in this kind of ostentatious, you know, story and, you know, spoiler alert, there's a long lost sibling that comes back um, from this. Um, and so, uh, you know, Jane the Virgin became revolutionary, you know, because it's kind of this, um, the story of, wow, Latina's gone mainstream, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the protagonist herself has gotten in trouble, right? For sort of the way in which kind of she has taken on that role. And I'm wondering, you know, not, not in terms of just say a, a show like Jane the Virgin, but in terms of other illustrations that we find in society, how this kind of politics of authenticity or how this question of who gets to speak has resolved itself in different ways. And if you can think of kind of other illustrations, right, um, of, of whether it's uh, uh, Latinas lighter skinned or, or darker skinned Latinas in terms of their representation of society. You mentioned the, uh, the Zoe Saldana uh, question and her representation of Nina Simone. I'm curious if you can think of other kind of examples that are either um, have resolved themselves positively or, or have shown the kind of growth of the people involved? Or if no, we, we're just sort of in the middle of, of a mess right now. I mean, we're definitely in the middle of a mess right now. And when I think about the women that have outed themselves as actually being white people and the fact that they were allowed to pass pass, you know, in terms of like color and skin tone. And so like, who gets to go to the front of the line? It is typically those of us that are lighter skin. And when there are darker skin women in roles, they are particular roles. Annalise Keating would have been a very different character if she was played by, I don't know, um, anybody else because because Viola Davis is amazing. But like, if she had been portrayed by a lighter skin, actress, the character would have changed because there's this notion that darkness is associated, especially among Black women, with anger and attitude and things of that nature. And so when I'm thinking about, like, and I was, ugh, there were so many interesting photos of like telenovelas that I thought I was going to use. And then I was like, I only have 10 minutes, so I can't do everything. But there is this constant like breakdown of which roles certain actresses, and especially among women, that they get to play. Like there's more latitude for range in terms of male characters, in terms of skin tone. But 
that too like varies. And so kind of when we're seeing people that are propped up in the media with either that are Afro-Latina or just black in general, they're typically the lighter skin actresses. And what I find hopeful, I guess there is some hope, is that younger actresses like Yara Shahidi and Zendaya are even saying that they want to use their platforms in order to make space for more range in terms of complexion, because there is a range, but we have these ideas and these understandings of who gets to be beautiful and what beauty is that's based on these colonial ideas of getting close to whiteness. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I have a follow-up, but actually we have a couple of, of, of Q&A uh, questions that have come through the Q&A, so I'll, I'll leave that follow-up for a bit later. Um, first, I'll leave the names of the, of the folks who are asking anonymous, un unless you want to sort of identify yourself in your comments. And um, uh, we, have a, we have a positive comment thanking all of, of, all of you for your advocacy and passion. And then we have a question that um, may be for um, Brian, but I'll, I'll leave it open to anyone who also wants to weigh in. And the question says, when thinking about a tri-racial category of society, uh, how are Asians potentially being considered and brought into solidarity with anti-racist actions? So that's one question, uh, and, and I'll, I'll ask you all to hold that just to, so we don't let the comments um, uh, build up too much. Uh, we have another comment uh, thanking all of you for the, the presentations and the discussions of the topic. And then we have a question specifically for Letitia. Um, I'm wondering what an Afro-Latinx pessimism would look like. I'm thinking about what Sebastian said about Latini how Latinidad begins before the border, yes, uh, or how particular imperialist history of Afro-Latinx folks could draw from the discourse of Afro-pessimism and Christina Sharp's uh, wake or, or, or her work on um, In the Wake, right? So, uh, so two questions, one about the tri-racial categorization of society and Asians, and then um, a question on Afro-Latinx pessimism. So um, I'll let uh, you all weigh in as, as you like. I guess I can jump in. I'm gonna share my screen again to, just to have reference to um, Bonilla Silva's uh, categorization here, right? And and for Bonilla Silva, he he says, oh, you know, some some Asian origin people do have access to whiteness, right? Now it's it's unclear who that some is, um, right? I mean, probably brings to mind this idea of model minority and all of that, but we also see Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, Korean Americans, and Asian Indians in this honorary whites category. And, and that seems perhaps to um, maybe be accurate as far as this categorization goes, but I also think we can perhaps, let me stop sharing here, um, think about it by also looking at the history of, of multiracial solidarity, right? And I mean, the subheading of this, this panel was about the myth of a rainbow coalition but we can look to the, the original Rainbow Coalition, right, in, in the 1960s, which was, you know, we had the Black Panthers, the Young Lords and the Young Patriots working together, right? So you had a Black group, um, a Puerto Rican sovereignty group, and, um, and poor whites working together in Chicago, right? But we also had, um, on the West Coast, people like Richard Aoki, who ended up being, I think, an FBI informant. There's controversy around there, but, but you had, Asian solidarity with the Black Power movement, right? So I think this, in some way, I don't want to say Bonilla Silva is presenting an ahistorical argument because I think he's very in tune to history. But I, but I think if we look at social movement building and solidarity moving, um, solidarity um, building, we can see that there's a long history of, of solidarity, um, right, of, of, of Asian immigrants, um, uh, with black folks, with Latinx folks, um, and with, with, with Asian Latinx folks and, and Afro-Latinx folks, right? But, um, that there's, there's always been this, this solidarity. I, I think the, the questions that arise for me, though, and I, and I think, right, I, I think in his more recent work, especially, Frank Wilderson says, like, things like, oh, I don't, I don't give a shit about solidarity. I think that was like his exact words, right? And he says he says it in a moment of anger at some white um, organizers of a panel. But, but this, this idea of, well, listen, 
you, you can work in solidarity all you want, but you're going to get yours and we're still going to be here. Right. So it, it's, it's gotta be solidarity that works to actually undo anti-blackness. And I don't know that we can undo anti-blackness without undoing the world as we know it. And that's a, a scary pers um, prospect. Um, and so this, this solidarity work, it, it can never be simply, Oh, I'll work with you and you'll work with me and I'm going to get mine. And then that's going to be it, right? It needs to be consistent and critical and, and radical to the point of, of recognizing that the, the world as we know it cannot exist without anti-blackness. And, and that's, that's terrifying, right? That, that's far more terrifying um, even than, than calls for socialism are for rich folks, right? Like we can, we can, you know, change the ownership of the means of production, change who has a say in what, change the distribution of wealth, and then move forward. But, but to, to undo anti-blackness is to undo what holds the modern world together. And I, so I think this is where my question's about how we can build solidarity, which is what my, my project, I think, is concerned with, really, really hits this wall. And I, and I don't know what the answer is as far as where we can go. Right, but, but, but I think these categorizations, the tri-racial categorization is, is helpful in some ways for thinking about movement along these lines and for, for, for presenting a choice, I think, right? You can, you can ally yourself with whiteness and have access to a lot of really nice stuff. Or you can say, I don't want any of that, that the world without privilege is better than one built on the, the backs, literally built on the backs of black people. Would anyone like to weigh in on that question? Or uh, Letitia, we can also turn um, to the question about uh, an Afro-Latinx um, pessimism. I mean, um, thank you, Brian, for your comments. Like, it's it's true. Like, being allied with whiteness does come with privileges, but not everybody has access to that, right? And so, but then you do always have the few people that are propped up, you know, like Herman Cain and Candace Owens. So we all saw what happened to Herman. So I'm just saying, maybe you don't want to ally too closely but that was really rude. I'm so sorry about that. That was rude. But um, thinking about an Afro-Latinx um, pessimism, we'd have to go back. We'd have to go way back. And like thinking about what Sebastian said about historization. And I just really, it's such a good question. I don't know. It's, I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't know. Beautiful thought, though. I'm gonna marinate on that. And uh, you know, here is I think where uh, at least one of the possible blind spots in in the way in which um, in the United States the social sciences and the humanities um, are often kind of produced, but but definitely uh, changing. Um, uh, over the course of even just a short amount of time is the way in which in former colonial settings, whether we're talking about Haiti in the Francophone context or whether we're talking about kind of the whole of Latin America with the wide variety of experience that um, African um, peoples, Afro-descendant peoples have had, um, there are, I'm sure, uh, resources available to think about that Afro-Latinx pessimism. It's, there's just a, a, several barriers, right? There's the historical barrier that Sebastian mentioned. There's a language barrier, and, and Leticia knows this well, um, mm -hmm. in thinking about sort of the differences between sort of Portuguese, Spanish, and, and Portuñol, if we think about kind of the way in which those um, barriers get blended, um, and how even in a moment of um, intellectual uh, ferment and maybe intellectual radicalization, um, there are, there's a lot more room for that type of scholarship now, but it comes at a premium, right? It comes at a premium of being sort of this weird creature that you're not really going to get recognized out there and you think about the specter of academic work and even yeah. the lines between academic work and advocacy or academic work and justice. If we think about um, the beginning uh, type of responses to people uh, collaborating on the scholar strike, Right? You have sort of the threat of the entire weight of the state of Texas or the state of Mississippi on scholars that are basically, in one vision, doing their job, right? We're trying to kind of bring to attention these injustices and, and even creating more work for themselves as they try to bring uh, more people into an understanding of what are these issues and where do they come from and how maybe can we work to unravel some of them, right? You see the whole weight of a system basically pushing against that. 
And, and, and in a way, the repercussion is going to be less people willing to take those risks as we go further down the line. Um, uh, Sebastian, did you want to weigh in on any of what's been said so far, or would you like to wait a bit? Um, just one thing, I think I, I want to... First of all, Adisha, you are fine with that comment. I, I, you don't need to apologize for that. Uh, I think that was, that's perfectly fine. Um, um, but what, what, what you guys were saying, and, and especially Brian, like, you know, you, you raise a very interesting point of the, the anxiety that, that uh, the, this idea that, um, you know, um, there's no way out, at least in the context of the structure that we are now. I don't want to push to something else. Maybe it's liberating, you know? Um, and I'm going to go to the old Karl Marx and, and say that, and Mauro don't uh, um, And I want to say, you know, you know when, when the guy goes and says like, well, you know, there's a, this class that combines all the problems of the world and realizes that there's no way out, but just bringing it down. And I think, and I think that there's a room for solidarity there. Uh, um, you know, in the sense of um, realizing that in the, you know, in these, in the way the modern, black, uh, the modern world is structured surrounding anti-blackness and how capitalism is strongly embedded with racism and they both go hand in hand and they're inseparable in many ways is, well, maybe we need to arrive to the final realization that we need to bring the system down and the structure down. Now, that's definitely not easy. Uh, and it's extremely, you know, and none of us wants to, uh, you know, just renounce to our material privileges and material comfort and so on. That's extremely difficult, uh, especially for many of us who are in that limbo situation that we are not exactly part of the working class, but we are very far from the middle class also. Um, but on the other hand, you know, once you, you're facing that situation and you say, well, there's no way out, it, it can be also liberating. And I think that, you know, and, and going back to what Leticia was saying, you know, um, if we think about the work of Fanon, if we think about the work of Mariategui, if we think about the work of Amilcar Cabral, and how, you know, and even here, you know, other authors here, in the way that they went, read Marx and go to Marx and saw the ideas and so on, and started to transform those ideas and incorporate those ideas to the new reality and understanding the social context and so on. It can be, it's extremely frightening, and I am, you know, but it can also be liberating. Okay, while we're waiting for uh, maybe a couple of other questions and comments, um, I had a, um, a follow-up uh, a little bit to Letitia and, and a little bit to um, Sebastian. Uh, so uh, uh, in, in the last few months, as uh, at least in the United States, we're, we're reeling from um, an unending uh, pandemic, a whatever you want to call it, constitutional uh, uh, crisis cluster, fill in the dot. Um, uh, you have the continued and renewed expression, uh, once again, of, um, of police violence, right, especially against black bodies. And this time around, you have an American audience that is a bit more captive in the sense that, well, you know, presumably people are, are at home all the time now, and they're watching these protests um, in Wisconsin, and they're also watching NBA players uh, threatening uh, to to you know burst their nice little bubble uh, and 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 boycott uh, future games. And they're watching uh, Naomi Osaka, right, the young um, uh, Japanese-born uh, but uh, whose father is Haitian um, tennis uh, star. Um, you know, wear the names of of of, of these black men who have been shot uh, uh, and and killed. Um, in ways that are, uh, you can't escape that in your faceness of it anymore. You can't just turn the channel now because, well, in a sense, the, the media bubble is completely wrapped up around any little thing that blips, all right, uh, the disturbance that disturbs um, uh, the, the, the already delicate balance. And so, in one sense, um, there's a question there related to kind of Sebastian's point. I mean, isn't this why we have so many more protests, so many more um, acts of, uh, of solidarity, so many webinars, and so many kind of opportunities of, of academics, um, for better or for worse, if, if I'm not sure if this is the best way to reach out, um, but so many instances, right, of folks wanting to kind of burst that bubble of normalcy that isn't normal and sort of speak out. Right? So in thinking about these instances of media representations, but also these instances of concrete material action that people are taking, what are some of the instances that we see movement forward? Because the media sure as hell isn't gonna tell us, 
Um, and I'm wondering if you're in your own work or in your own thinking about this, is there movement forward in terms of um, whether it's defunding the police in Minneapolis or whether it's just simply gaining some traction in type of, in, in educating people? Um, is there movement forward? And if there's not movement forward, do we see more instances of blowback? Do we see instances where indeed many places, uh, you know, Sebastian and I spent quite a bit of time in the state of Florida, um, there, you know, a new order, you know, actual legal action against anyone that even publicly says that police should be defunded or police should be held accountable, right? Do we see instances of blowback where we see um, either racist uh, white supremacist states or just institutions really pushing back hard against um, this, per, this, this movement, um, this, this sort of explosion of action. And, and that's not just for Letitia and, and Sebastian, maybe Brian and, uh, and his experience um, can also weigh in. I would just say, like, of course, I'm going to first and foremost shout out the WNBA that was, you know, protesting long before the NBA came out because we always want to forget about the women when it comes to the movements, but I'm not going to let it happen. And I'm thinking specifically about, like, Maya Moore, who took off two years of her career and was a rising star in order to free wrongly convicted Jonathan Irons. And so like that is movement forward. She was actually able to contribute to his release, which is something that so many people that are in wrongfully in prison desire and thinking about um, how the Wubble and the WNBA have been the most strategic and the most vocal about social justice and dedicating their entire seasons to justice for Breonna Taylor and how we're seeing, you know, the state shut down in a state of emergency while they're gonna ready to render the verdict, which just tells me that it's not gonna be something we're gonna be happy to hear. So there is blowback in that sense, but there's also like at the same time, this push for change and what that change is gonna look like, I have no idea. Um, so, First of all, I want to reinforce what the teacher said regarding the WNBA. I think that WNBA is much, 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 much more radical than the NBA. They have much more to lose. They have much less support, material and, and media and so on. And, um, and don't forget that the, the, the NBA, like, they stopped a couple of games and they very quickly went back. You know, they have a conversation with the... They say there was a conversation with Obama and other political leaders and very, you know, they came back. And all my hopes of a whole, you know, large strike, general strike, and so on, went very much on more, uh, like out of, you know, out of the equation. And I wasn't, I was disappointed, but not surprised. Um, while the WNBA has, you know, has been very much stronger, and so on, which shows, you know, that actually, as, as Patricia Hill Collins has systematic, and not only her, but many others, but you know, I've been reading Patricia Hill Collins recently for my work, so that's why I'm, I'm signing her has been systematically documenting the, the strong role that black women have played and keep playing in trying to change our society. Um, one year, there's a lot of backlash, uh, and there has been. First of all, it's very difficult to sustain the level of protest that happened at the beginning. It's very difficult, especially in the situation that we are. I think that the level of protest was also, you know, this, the, the explosion of protest uh, police violence is nothing not new, and and you know police uh, uh, the protest against police violence burst when there was YouTube videos, and there were when there wasn't YouTube videos. So I don't think that the, the videos itself, uh, although you know the George Floyd uh, video was extremely powerful and disturbing, um, but uh, I think that it was a combination of the fact that we were in a pandemic and people were tired and exhausted and so on. The other is I think that the electoral situation also helped. You know having a white supremacist, xenophobic, racist in the White House supporting white supremacists. But on the other hand, the, the disappointment by many activists of what the Democratic Party has, uh, has done uh, also sparked in cer certain sense um, going forward. Um, taking out Trump from the equation, I think that um, much of the political discourse that has come from at least the main, the, the main candidates of the Democratic Party, another, another aspect is a, it's a, it's a revamping on the discourse of reform. And we already know that that doesn't work. You know, Minneapolis spent millions and millions of dollars in unconscious bias training, in, you know, de-escalation, in uh, uh, sensi sensibility and so on. And it's not only that they were the producers of the death of George Floyd, but if you look at those who have been studying systematically in Minneapolis, you know, nothing has changed since then. 
there's extreme limits to reform, um, especially because reform is based on this idea that racism is a question of individual attitudes, and not, it's not systematic and so on, so the whole industry of unconscious bias, et cetera, uh, plays on that. Uh, it has become, as Nicole Siegel says, like a little bit of a Trojan horse in which everybody's, everybody walks on it, but on the other hand, it's like it completely insulates the institutional and structural elements of racism that are very much present. I do think that the moment is gonna go forward. I don't think that the movement is gonna be completely disbanded or whatever. I think that it's gonna keep going. Um, there are a lot of you know, people that are tired and so on and people that are coming to understand. And I think that the pandemic has created that situation. Um, we will have to wait and see, uh, but definitely from at least the, the, the whole political spectrum. It goes from the extreme right wing of law and order and let's keep crashing and, and, you know, and testing how much we can kill protesters and keep killing and keep doing the stuff to the, you know, the reformist. So in the political world, there's not a lot of voices that are supporting these protests. Um, but there are people in the ground that are working hard and there are some, you know, interesting uh, elements of solidarity, you know, um, different groups from Native Americans to Pacific Islanders to Latino people uh, and basically, you know, of course, black people. Um, but again, if we are talking about who, who could be that universal, that class of people that group everything and can destroy, I would put my money to black women. Um, I definitely would put my money there. Um, but anyway, we'll have to wait and see. Brian, would you like to weigh in or should we move on to another question? Um, if there's more questions, I think we should keep moving forward. Okay, so, um, and uh, to speak a bit uh, to um, Letitia's point, um, I don't know if solace is the right word, or, or and it's definitely not consolation. But um, when the decision uh, in in the Breonna Taylor murder uh, case was made to award um, uh, her family twelve million dollars uh, in the middle of a pandemic, instead of um, even mildly punish or create any sense in which someone was in the wrong. Uh, in this situation um, does speak quite a bit uh, to um, the, the great, already, as we know, burden on black women as being kind of the, the bearers, both in terms of um, uh, the afterlives of, of reproductive slavery through the actual ones that supposedly um, change is going to come through. And I know Sebastian meant that in a, in a kind of positive sense, right? Um, um, but, but again, this massive burden on, um, on black women um, uh, but also the, the way in which um, uh, the figure of the black women, whether it's through the NBA, whether it's through um, uh, Breonna Taylor, whether it's through uh, media representations in um, popular culture um, uh, or, or film or art, um, has become this kind of, uh, has entered a new level of sort of um, capitalist exploitation. Right, and there's money, right, for sort of the alleged right kind of black woman to kind of speak out, right? There's an entire industry around kind of um, documentaries, uh, whether it's about radicals like Nina Simone or uh, uh, figures that we admire, but who are very much wrapped up in um, the dominant power structure like Michelle Obama or Beyonce for that matter, right? And I'm wondering um, in your kind of experience as you think through not solutions to this problem, but I mean, in a way, kind of thinking critically about um, the position of black women. Um, I'm wondering what you would tell either white allies or folks who are watching, you know, and, and happen to be lighter skin or white, you know, um, some of the problems with these representations to be sure, but also, you know, what is it that they can lead us to discover, right? So, you know, you think of, for instance, Sadia Hartman's work here um, on, on kind of being able to reconstruct the intimate lives um, of black women, right? And the lives of, of women in the Caribbean, right? And the lesson here is not to neither create a hagiography nor to martyrize, but rather to really sit with the uncomfortableness and, and listen to those stories in a way that helps us ask better questions and helps us think better um, about uh, our own, say, as, as, a, as a white, lighter-skinned male, our own kind of, um, uh, the way we benefit, right, from that exploitation of Black women, right? And I'm wondering if, if you know, you can kind of point us to even better questions or, or more self-interrogating questions that we can ask as we think about this, um, these challenges and these representations. And then for um, Brian, uh, going back to um, 
kind of thinking a little bit about your own, um, where you were sort of positioned at Fullerton, right? Um, uh, I, I, while watching or while looking at your shared screen and thinking about your presentation, uh, I kept thinking about students, right? And um, the students that you probably see at, um, at C in the CSU system are probably different than the students that Letitia and I and Veronica see kind of at Virginia Tech. Um, and whereas, you know, Letitia and I, you know, shock our students with perhaps even might be the mildest kind of comparison as to sort of the power of white supremacy on the history of ideas or sociology. I'm wondering what your students, and, and this is a question for Sebastian as well, how sort of they tackle these things and how, how they think through them uh, and the problems that arise. And I don't know if Letitia would like to go first or, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I'll go. Um, thinking about um, being more critical, like, I mean, one of the things that has been on my mind heavily since all of these women have been coming out and their efforts at passing is like, why? And the ways in which that Black women are exploited, the ways in which we don't get promoted, the ways in which we are, especially within like the academy, like, for what reason are you utilizing our oppression for your benefit when you have this built-in privilege? Like, why? you need to really interrogate that about yourself. Um, I think that this idea that Black women are here to save the world is interesting and also problematic, not because we haven't, because we have. We have been, you know, the backbone of this nation, but also just like, why? But then there's also the ideas of like the whole, Kumbahi River Collective, that if Black women were free, we would all be free. And so I think that the ideas that we need to go back to are to our roots and what we can do in order to, you know, free Black women such that we can all live our lives at the intersections of race, class, gender, sexualities in a society that is actually, I mean, I don't even want to say civil. Like, what is even the point of civility? Like, who does civility belong to? Who gets to be civil? Like, who is marked as being uncivil? And what is it about them that marks them as such? And so, oh man, there are just so many different questions that we have to ask, especially as we move into this election in the next few months and like thinking about who we discuss as being problematic voters. And it's like, well, if you look at it as a block, like black women did what they were supposed to do. Like it wasn't us. So it's like, you need to interrogate like yourselves and see what it was and who it was that didn't do what they were supposed to do. Or I mean, I guess supposed to, depending on the type of society that you wanna live in, but considering the society that we're in right now and the state of the world and the fact that we are probably gonna be in lockdown again soon because the second wave is coming, like, and we can't deny the fact that it's because our political leaders handled it incorrectly. Like, it's just, I don't know, there's a lot. There's a lot. But thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my, my school is probably very different from Virginia Tech, um, but prior to coming to Fullerton, I, I was at a primarily white liberal arts college in the Midwest, um, you know, where there were, they made efforts to diversify, because that's always the, the key word on universities, right, is diversity, um, and, you know, they, so they'd recruit students from um, Chicago, and then not provide means for them to actually stay living there over the summer or to finish their degrees, right? So retention was not great. Um, but while I was there, I, I was labeled as uncivil, right? For speaking out when we had a, a guest on campus who was basically echoing white supremacist talking points, but I wasn't modeling civil behavior for the students or something like that. That's just a, a side note. Uh, but, at, but at Cal State Fullerton, right, we're, um, nearly 50% Latinx students, um, but only 2% Black students, right? So it's, um, it's serving a very particular community there. Um, I think we're under 20% white identified students. Um, and it's, it's also, you know, fairly working class. Um, it's a commuter campus. And I've been amazed. Like, I was talking, I'm teaching American political thought right now. And I'm, you know, we're going over um, kind of the, the dead white men portion of the class. And, you know, the students are just like railing into the constitution, like, you know, line by line, clause by clause, like, no, and this here is connected to such and such. And I mean, they, they know who they are. They know how they are valued or not valued by this country. And it's, it's 
really awesome seeing them like confidently presenting those perspectives, um, which you, you might not get at a primarily white institution where you might have students who are somewhat afraid to, to share those views, right? But this was, and, and I think Zoom might have something to do with it as well, right? Where you're not physically in a classroom with people. Um, so I, I've experienced a lot of that on campus, but also the black students have been increasingly radical and increasingly active um, um, in the, the one year I've been here on campus. And so that's been amazing to see. And then to see faculty taking the lead from a lot of this, and, and Sebastian will know this as well, but there's, I'm assuming, um, there's a movement across the CSUs um, to abolish the campus police, right? Working in solidarity with the UCs. And this seems, it's all really great, but it's also still, these are campuses that are these little protected pockets um, in larger communities. And so I think there's a, there's a hope that this spills over into the communities and that there's, you know, solidarity continues to grow. Um, but the, the students on the campus have been incredible, especially considering that, you know, there's, I mean, there's a myth of California being kind of this progressive utopia, but there's also within California, Orange County, right? You go beyond the orange curtain and it's, it's a Republican stronghold, but that's been changing recently and seeing these students at the forefront of that has been really empowering and invigorating for, for myself, you know, as, as someone who's from California, Southern California as well, and seeing the changes that have been happening, it's been really great. Just to add to, to Brian, like it's, it's very similar here. Um, the campus is, seems a little bit of an island compared to the city and, and the Central Valley, which is a very conservative place. Um, and which, you know, the, as I said at the beginning, you know, um, mass incarceration is a strong, uh, it's, it's one of the strongholds of mass incarceration, uh, not only in California, but in the country, I would say. And it has a strong constituency. Um, you know, systematically, many of the propositions to of tough on crime and, you know, supporting mass incarceration have have received a lot of voting here in the area. Um, but on the other hand, the campus is very active. You know, there was a Black Lives Matter tool log was created recently and basically formed by high school students and, and uh, university students. Um, I work also with, with a group of parents and teachers that are trying to change the uh, school system here and make it a little bit more um, open at least. I don't know how to put it, but a little bit more equitable. Uh, and the stories of racism are, are widespread and so on. So, so the problem, the, the different element that I face is that I work in the criminal justice department uh, and it's very different from the other departments and it's a very large one. And as I said, you know, for many, for many people, many low income Latinos in this area, which uh, is close to half, um, it's, a, it's an important, you know, working uh, source of work and, and, you know, they're very good, they're very good paying jobs and it's a way of social mobility and so on. And there's, you know, the school to prison pipeline, which is very strong in the area, has also the effect of creating this ethos around policing and around criminal justice and so on, that it's not necessarily the negative ones that we, we, we see in our research. And, and you know, uh, so, so there's a perspective, there's a support and so on. Um, so actually, you know, students don't, don't get surprised. Like many, most of my students don't get surprised with the things that they, they see or read in my classes because many of them have experienced that. Uh, but on the other hand, it's as many of them tell, they tell me like, you know, at the end of the day, I need a job. And those are the best paying jobs in the area. Uh, and, and it's difficult, you know, it's difficult, it's very difficult for them this challenge of, I am aware of the problems of police violence and so on. But on the other hand, you know, and mass incarceration, I see, it, you know, I, I leave them, I see it in my family. On the other hand, I need a well-paying job, so um, and I need to survive and, and so on. So it's, it's, it's complicated. Um, it's complicated in that sense. Um, it's a dilemma that has been following me since the two years that I've been here on how to, you know, balance that criticism and that need for, for critical minds and critical thinking with the material needs of also my students, because at the end of the day, as much as I can be critical in Zoom or, or in the classroom, I come back to my house and, you know, I have a paycheck at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the month. Most of my students don't. Um, and mass incarceration offers them a way out. 
Okay, um, in the last minute um, we have, um, I have one very short, tiny question um, for our panelists, but before uh, we go to them on that point, um, join me again if you're at home and you're still with us. Uh, thank you uh, to all of our great um, panelists and for starting this conversation. Um, and I say starting in that, uh, I know they are doing amazing work um, in their own um, spheres. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm really thankful for the fact that they were able to join us for this brief time um, and share some of the, these thoughts. Um, uh, stay tuned for more programming from El Centro uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, and I can say now um, uh, uh, that stay tuned for um, a very special lecture on October 13th. We'll have um, Dr. Uh, Jomaira Figueroa, who's Associate Professor of Global Diaspora Studies at Michigan State University. We'll be talking about um, her new forthcoming book, have sort of a special plenary lecture. And of course, um, if you go to our Facebook page on uh, for El Centro, uh, there's uh, plenty of programming happening over the course of the next few weeks um, uh, uh, around food, around identity, around um, uh, more politics, of course. Uh, and we're hoping to put together at least one more event um, in the lead up to uh, the election. Um, uh, in just a few more weeks. Um, uh, and to give our panelists the last word in just a few uh, seconds, um, if you will, uh, if there's like one thing you want those people who are still with us at home to go right now and read, um, please, 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 uh, uh, what would that be? Just just the, the, the title or, or, the, or the one thing that they should go um, either for educational purposes, for radicalization purposes, or just to sort of, you know, take a moment and, and really uh, process uh, the weight of everything that we've brought into this room, um, uh, what would that be? And as I'm letting you all um, think about that, the last plug I'll say is um, uh, we'll share, um, uh, if that's okay with the panelists, um, uh, some contact information so that if you have more questions for them, um, you can reach out to them personally. Uh, and again, you'll find that information on our um, Facebook page for Acentro, or you can write to me directly at uh, maroj at vt.edu. Um, so if you've had a moment to think about it, um, what would that one thing be? Letitia. I'm going to say that you should all be reading Mina Salami's Sensuous Knowledge, a Black Feminist Approach for Everyone. Done. Perfect. Brian, Sebastian. <laughs> um, I, I don't know about just one book off the top of my head. Um, it could be an article. It could be a, a BuzzFeed, a listicle. I don't know. Uh, what, what's that one thing you want people listening at home? The Bahi River Collective, I think, then. I know Letitia mentioned them before, but like, if you haven't read it, read it. It's where we get our term identity politics from. Um, they did groundbreaking work, so dig into them. Um, and I think I know what Sebastian's going to say, but I'm going to let him. Karl Marx, of course, but that's obvious. Everybody needs to read it. Everybody has to read it. Read all its work. Um, that's obvious. But um, I was going to say uh, uh, Kianga Yamada Taylor, but Brian already saw the, said the Combahee uh, River. So, uh, but from Black, Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation is a very good book. Um, and Rick Fanon. Read Franz Fanon, please read Franz Fanon. If you're not willing to read Marx, which I think it's a mistake, you should read Franz Fanon. And I have a very good friend that writes very good articles and recently, or is about to get a very good book, which his name is Mauro Garaccioli, which I strongly recommend. Uh, I definitely recommend read Mauro's work uh, and engage with him. He loves, you know, engaging. He loves people criticizing and challenging him. So do that. On that, on that happy note, um, thank you all once again for powering through this Tuesday evening. Um, we'll do the awkward um, Zoom wave, uh, and please, uh, please stay in touch with El Centro and our programming. And thank you once again to our, our fearless leader, uh, our director uh, Veronica Montes, for um, all her support. Have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>